que eso. Okay. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, today we'll be talking about web scripting in Python or web scripting using Python. And before we start, I would just do a bit of an introduction and let me just share my screen because uh, share screen okay so what's what's going to happen is that we're going to be using this book on um, automate the boring stuff which i told you about so i sent you guys a copy of this and um uh the author has graciously made it free uh I'll, I'll swear God, if I if I get his name correctly, well, I'll I'll make all his books free online. He even puts it up on a web page dedicated to the book, so you can see all the chapters. Such a great guy. So, um, all his books are free, and but you could just donate. That's the way he makes his income. He gets to donate or buy on Amazon or all of this if you want to. And um, he also has a lot of Udemy courses that are free, but there's one particular one that's the accompanying course for this, this very course of the Middle Boring stuff. Um, sometimes in a month, he does it free, but at the other times he, he, it's paid because I think right now it's going, it's going for, for nine USD or something, I can't remember. All right, so, but, but Ali's a great guy. And we all love our, all right. So let's let's talk about web scraping. But before I go into using Al's material, I think I'm just going to do a little bit because um, what I want to introduce is the concept behind web scraping. Why do we even have to scrape the web? And when we want to scrape the web, what are we scraping for? And how do we go about scraping for what we want to scrape? So um, I'm just going to open my PowerPoint. Um, so let me just, or should I use whiteboard? I think the whiteboard might take us a lot of time, but let's see, let's see how that works. Okay, so um, now when we, okay, you come up quickly, quickly. Let's, let's hit the road. Okay, just a second, it's going to come up. Okay, cool. All right, so, oh, dirty whiteboard. Okay, so let's move this come on okay now so let's have come on go you know what i'm just going to clean up and see share uh, canvas yep okay so we can have a fresh canvas to play with all right, so um, now when we talk about web scraping, we are talking about scarring the web for information. We're trying to pull stuff from the web. And the web is like practically the world's reservoir of information, resource, whatever it is that you want. You can get it off the web. So usually there are um, different kinds of data that we want to pull from the web. So I'm just going to list a few of them. So sometimes we might want to pull text from the web. Some other times we want to pull uh, tables. Some other time, what we want to pull are maybe pictures. 
And then some other time when we want to pull could be videos, could also be audio, could be any formats basically, anything that you want to pull. All of this resides on the web. But the question now is most times we want to pull these re this resources. These are all called resources, right? We want to pull these resources because we either need them as inputs to another program that we are writing that will help us in our data science work or even in our software development work. And we just need these inputs coming in from this source live, like real time. So that's the reason why most times we get to do web scraping, all right? So for texts, if you want to scrape um, web, let me just erase this resource. So if you want to scrape texts, there are libraries that you can use. And this is why we love Python because these guys in Python, they make it very easy for us and we, we, we love them, all right? So um, there, are, there are libraries like Beautiful Soup. and selenium when you want to script text now what's the difference between these two there's also scrapey but it's not very popular like these two because these two are straightforward very easy to use and you'll be fine with them scrapey is a bit more technical to set up but it's a very good scraper once you can set it up um so when you want to script tables good old pandas comes to your rescue when you want to script pictures, you can use stuff like OpenCV or Matplotlib. When you want to script videos and audios, there, there are a lot of um, tools, you know, that Python provides for all of this, but it's not very popular to script this tool unless you're into multimedia or maybe like you want to create a YouTube downloader or something like that. Okay, so that's when you now say, okay, let me just go um, create a video scraper. So we'll not, we'll not touch, even this one, we probably are not going to touch these three because scraping pictures would fall into the domain of machine learning and, and all of that. But um, if you look at Al's book, Al's book has, it has a page for scraping pictures. So we might just touch that um, I think I think it's in the later part of the text. That's in chapter twelve. Oh yeah, this is it. So it's talked about scraping pictures from XKCD. So you can even not do it any. Um, you can even not do it anything like OpenCV or all of that. We probably are going to look at that when we get there. Right. So back to our whiteboard. So these are the for the for the time being, if we if we have enough time, we probably are going to look at this. But we're going to start with scraping tables first because it's much straightforward. And like I said, when you want to scrape a table, good old pandas comes to your rescue. So let's see how these things work. Now, um, I love Chris Hemsworth, so I'm just going to close this. Um, so I'm just going to scroll up. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling very fast. Now, when you look at Chris Hemsworth Wikipedia, very handsome guy, you know, Thor and um, yeah, extraction. All right. So when you look at that, um, you'll see that the wiki page is arranged in such a way that you have text and then you have um contents and then you have text and you have text and you have text and you have tables and all of that now everything you see on this web page is what you call html i'm going to take time to explain html in the course of this session so please remember as usual if you have any question if there's anything i said that is wrong or anything that you don't agree with or you want more clarification please feel free to stop us at any time and they will be glad to um, stop and talk about it. So 
when you when you have a page like this if you want to get the tables for example you can see that there are a couple of tables here the first table is the table about the films they have made second one television and the third video games about him awards and nominations that's the fourth table okay so there are just four tables now um let's let's bring in these tables into pandas all right let's just very simple um i'm just going to come to my collab and then i'm going to do imports sorry i import pandas as pd right and i'm going to call this um tables so I'm just going to call it tables and tables equal to pd dot if you want to get um, stuff from pandas you can use a method called read html all right html pardon me i need to i need to get this noise dealt with so let me just deal with it my system so So, um, those kids go very loud sometimes. All right, so, um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Back to PD with HTML tables. And now, what this read HTML method um, is asking for is just very simple. He wants the IO path. And then if you want to match any string or anything, in case you know the table name, now you can know the table name by just going to inspect the HTML. So for example, um, you can go to this table, all right? And just right click on the table and click on inspect and it will open up the table element for you. So here, you know that, okay, um, this is the table you're looking at, which is this wiki sortable. And how you know is the table you're looking at is, when you look at that part of the stuff, when you hover your mouse around it, you'd see that it becomes, the part that you're looking at becomes um, highlighted, All right? So this H3 is like the, par, um, the header here, which is film which is this, and then it, this is the table, and this is the table header. So you could see that it, it, it's highlighted, then this is the table body, so header body, all right? So that's, that's basically how we know this is what you're targeting. So if you have a particular thing about this table, you know about it, you know, maybe the name or whatever, or maybe something, you could, you could use it to search, all right? But, to show you just how it works, um, I'm just going to copy that URL and come to this place, and I'm just going to paste it here without any further parameters, just the URL. But like I said, if you know other parameters about the, the, the stuff, like um, the stuff name you want to match it with, uh, and any of all of these items, we could, we could just go ahead. Okay. So when I do this pd.readhtml, um, pd, oh, sorry, I can't run this. So now I, I could run this, uh, yeah. So now um, the next thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to, because when you, do, when you call these tables and you pass this website into it, what you've just done is that you have told HTML and pandas to go into this web page and grab all the tables. So how you know that pandas grabbed all the tables is you can check the length of the table item. And then when you run it, you'd see how many tables pandas grabbed. Oh, pandas grabbed nine tables, but there are four tables in the book. So what it means is that since there are one, two, three, four, it means that it's possible that pandas saved some other things in tabular form. So for example, these things you're seeing here, 
might actually be in tabular form, all right? Um, so pandas might have seen, okay, we'll grab this, this since it's a table, this references to the way they are arranging columns might also be in a tabular form, all right? So pandas is saying something we're not seeing with our eyes, all right? So, but let's just go pick those tables one by one so that we can even see, um, we could see what, what each of the tables look like. So as usual, when pandas brings in a table like this, you can use the indexing method to get the table. So let's let's look at the first table and let's see what it looks like. Okay, so this is the first table pandas has seen, all right? And it's the table that shows, oh, okay, the table that shows, you can see his age, his um, years and all of that. And sorry, I'm going to scroll very fast again. If you, if you scroll up, uh, yeah, okay, so this is, so what Pandas is telling us that this is one table, this is another table, and yeah. So that's that's one of the tables Pandas is saying, but let's say we're interested in the table that has to do with his filmography. So we keep checking. Um, let's check table one, and let's see whether that's what we're looking for. Nah, this is not what we're looking for. So we'll look for table two. Yep, so this is what we're looking for, all right? So this table captures the filmography, um, the films he has starred in and, and every stuff, all right? So when you now get this, you can now decide to use any of the pandas methods to pull out whatever data you need from the table. So assuming it's just the title you need or it's just, um, it's just the, it's just the year and the title or something. You could just pull that out. So if it's just the title we need, just pull out the title. If it's um, whatever, we can just pull it up. Even if it's just one, one line or one row in the table, we could, we could always pull it up. So that's how Pandas um, makes HTML table scraping very easy. But aside that, once it's text, you want to scrape, maybe you want to get text. All right, we will then need to use beautiful soup. But, um, oh, yeah. From what I'm saying, does it mean this, it only reads tables? Because you said That's, read uh, HTML and then the only thing, and you're just uh, bringing out table. You did, first of all, the length brought out only the length of tables. Does it mean yes. on a website, what pandas? Those is looking for look yeah for is to look tables. for data frames yeah data frames okay data frames does. yeah anything that has a shape of a oh. data frame. yep okay thank and that's you. the data frame yeah it's a data frame um object handler so it definitely is not equipped to handle text so that's why whenever i want to script text we we'll use beautiful soup or selenium or any other ones All right thank you okay so um oh, as uh, oh, a question for yes. you i see your yeah, I see your uh, first couple of codes there. You read in pan, import panda. Um, and then I try and read HTML with the same Chris Hemsworth URL that you list. And it comes back and it gives me an error for LXML not, in, not found. Is there something else that okay. you may have I using, there I, using your, I don't have? Are you using your Jupyter Notebook or Collab? I'm using Jupiter, yes. Okay, you know what? I'm going to, let me just see. Okay, cool. Um, do, would you want to share your screen? Um, yeah, I, I could do that, sure. Okay, so let me stop sharing and then let's see your screen. Okay, are, are you seeing it now? Equal to P. Yeah, I can see that P there is HTML. And the error is. And I scroll down a little bit. LXML. Okay, up. yeah. You do not have an LXML parser installed in your system. 
So you would have to install it. That's what it means. Um, how do you install that? Let me see. Um, um, okay, so let me just, let me um, Google it right now and install LXML parser, not for Python, just LXML. Okay, so um, the quickest way is, okay, if you're using Linux, sudo, this is sudo mark, but let me see. Okay, now that means you you could use pip. Yeah, pip install LXML. So, um, so John, you could do this, yeah, mm -hmm. and just run it. It your 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 stuff should work. Just pip install LXML. And if you're if you're using your Jupyter notebook, you remember to put um, an exclamation in front, like this. So where's my code? So something like this, so that Python knows it's an imperative, and then. It's running. I just took that. Okay, is it working now? Okay, I got no error messages. Let me see if I get uh, length, if I still get that correct. But yes, it seems to be working now. Okay, it's working. Yep, got it. This okay. was this LXML. Cool. Okay, um, they are they are markup language readers. So there are different kinds of ways that um, people can put markup language. There are, there are like three of them that are very popular. There's XML that's extensible markup language. There's HTML that's hypertext um, markup language, and then there's L LXML. And I'm, I'm trying to remember the L in front of it. All right, but um, basically they're all markup languages. And I'm gonna talk about markup languages right now, all right? So um, now- So to install it in our Jupyter Notebook or in our system, we'll just pip install like this? Yes, just pip install, you'll be fine. And our Jupyter Notebook? Yes, yes, yes. But because of, I'm using Collab right now, it's already installed. Collab has all of those installed. I also have, I, I think I've installed that in my laptop. I can't remember, but I, I know I don't have this error message when I try to do um, read HTML, Thank even you. without this, yeah. Okay, so um, now, since we are done with reading tables, then let's go to reading text. So. Before we talk about reading texts, one of the things that you've noticed, because from this place where we talk about reading text, it starts becoming very, very tacky. Um, so, when we talk about HCML, what happens is this. Now, um, oh, sorry. I need to dispatch this call. Okay, sorry, sorry, I had to, I had to attend to that call. I'm very sorry about that. Okay, so this is what happens now. Um, there are, okay, see what happens when you enter a web, a web page like what we just did now. 
to go to Wikipedia. So, everything you see that is hosted on the web is hosted in this place called the back end. All right. And this back end is made up of two things a server and a database. So the database is where everything on the web is stored. Pictures, codes, um, videos, PDF downloads, PDF documents that you want to download. Um, everything is basically stored here, everything. And like I told you, all of these are called resources, all right? So what happens is this, when you type www.wikipedia.com or .org slash Chris Hemsworth. Now, this thing here, though we call it a website, is actually not just called a website. It's actually called a URL, which is Universal Resource Locator. So what this does is that we are, when we make this request through a browser or through anything called the clients, all right? And this client could be a browser, it could be a command prompt, because one of the things you would have noticed is that when you type pip install, it doesn't open your browser, it goes straight to the internet, right? And I'm sure you would have wondered how it happens, okay? Because your command prompt is actually a client too. It can go straight up to the internet without having to go through a browser. All right. So um, it's when you when you when you type in that this URL, you're actually sending a request, all right, from the client, which is either a browser or whatever. And this request is called a GET request. So you're saying, hey, Sava, I want you to go into the database and get me the resource that is located here. That's why this is called the universal resource locator. So when you send that over the internet server, what it does is it goes to the database that is mapped to this URL and returns everything that is um, attached to this URL in HTML form. And that's why um, HTML is called the language of the web, all right? But there are other markup languages that also work on the web, all right? Like we have seen LXML and XML. XML is also used to build Android applications for user interfaces and all that to make requests. So when we do this GET request, what the server sends back are mostly HTML documents. So when they send this HTML back, to the client, this is called the response, all right? And this response can be in different ways. First, there is the response 200, which means, okay, good to go. Then there is response 403, and then there's 404, like this is forbidden. Um, you're not allowed to access this resource. Um, 403, I think, is an error response that I can't remember now, but you could always Google up all this code. So if, the, if you send a GET request and the server responds, all right, what the server responds with first is, okay, this website is live, it's good to go, it's fine. But if not, maybe the website is forbidden or it's blocked or something, it will give you the corresponding error code, all right? So, but let's say the website is good to go. What it will send you are HTML files. Even if the website is not good to go, it will still send you HTML files that just contain these words, 403, 404, and all of that. So now when you take the HTML files, the clients you're using will do something called parsing. What is parsing? Very simple. Parsing is the process through which a web client, which is either a browser or a command prompt or any of those GUI applications, um, will receive a response pack from the server. 
in HTML or LXML or XML, but usually HTML, and try to analyze the HTML objects. So if the response is 200, what your client does, which is your browser most times, is to look at the tags or the, the, the code contained in this HTML file and try to align itself and render this HTML file in human readable form. And that's what Parson does. So in order to um, set these things in human readable form, you will notice that when you open a HTML document, you probably will see something like this, um, header or H1, all right? And then this is a header and then the closing tag H1, all right? So this is just basically, what you call this are uh, markups. What markups do is that they tell the clients how it should format the response that it got from the server. So that's what these markups do. So when the client, which is the browser, your um, Mozilla or Google Chrome sees this in the response, it says, oh, okay, so this is the header. So when it's rendering it, it will render this as the header. Then if it sees this and, you know, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y documents there, and then it sees the closing tag, it says, oh, this is a paragraph. So it renders this as a paragraph. If he sees it as anything, any tag, he renders this as that tag. So that's what you would see here. Now, um, you could always go to this website, w 3 Schools is one of my go-to resources. And then you get to understand how HTML tags look like. So these are the tags and there are a lot of them. And nobody says you should learn them or know them by heart because really, those days of um, having to code websites from scratch using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, they've gone. So right now what happens is there are a lot of drag and drop frameworks. If you use um, a, a blogger like WordPress or like um, Blogspot or any of these blog engines, you'll notice that you really do not have to write HTML. So as you move around blocks of lines or whatever, as you're typing, the, the, the Content management system like WordPress or Blogger or whatever it is we're using, Milkshake, they are all generating the HTML at the back end so that you don't have to do this grilling process of writing the HTML code. So that's what's happening right now. And that's why you really do not need to know all of this. You just need to know which ones occur frequently. All right. So usually every HTML will begin with a doc type, would have um, the HTML. This is the, sorry, I'm scrolling very fast. We'll have the HTML tag, which is the root. And then we'll have the header, which contains the metadata about that web page and everything like that. And then it will now contain the body, the body tag, which talks about all the other stuff, right? So let's just um, look at HTML elements, all right? So now let's talk about, let me go to this. Let's just look at, okay, so HTML elements. Now, let us look at what makes up an element. You see, every HTML that you see like this now, every block of code of HTML is called an element. So this block of code here is an element. This other block of code is another element, all right? And what are the things that make up elements? Three things make up an element. The first are tags, which are these. These are the tags. The second are the contents, which is what the element is conveying. So in this case, this is a header, this is a paragraph, it is whatever it is that the element is conveying. So tags, there's the content. And then the last part, are attributes. So what are attributes? Well, um, attributes are, let me just show you an example. If you look at this, this HTML, for example, um, 
you'll notice that you can see there is the tag, another tag, and there is just the content. Now look at another kind of HTML elements. Let me just show you this. Now look at this. You'll notice that there is the tag, and then there is this, and then there is the elements. Uh, there's, the, there's the content, sorry. You see this thing that you have here is called an attribute. So what is an attribute? An attribute is um, something that gives an extra explanation or an extra direction to either the HTML or the CSS or whatever other helpers that you would need to read that element. So in this case, this attribute is saying, hey, um, these visit schools should actually be a href, that's a hyperlink reference, all right? So if I click on this and I say run it, you would notice that if this web browser is rendering this, this stuff, you would see it here, that you can, you can see it here, that this W3 schools and all that is the attributes attached to this content here. So how you know something is an attribute is usually that it usually has a variable name equal to something. So whenever you see, whenever you're using HTML and you see variable name equal to something, it means that that thing is an attribute and it's not part of the elements per se, it's just an explainer or an additional helper so that when the client, which is your browser or the command line or whatever it is you're using, is rendering that thing, he already knows how to deal with that, that, that thing, all right? So these are the three elements of HTML, all right? If you have a question at this point, we could, we could take it, but if not, we could go ahead if you think um, we're good. So question, any? No question? None? Okay, cool. So when we want to script text, all right, in a web page, from a web page, what we want to do is the first thing you want to do is to go and inspect that page. And you see, this is the most annoying part of web scraping. Web scraping is not one of those things you would say I built my web scraper and I'm going to bed no you have to keep checking every morning because the moment the owner of this website that you're scraping changes one thing changes one tag or changes one format when you try to send a get request from that app you're building or that's whatever it is you're building and you're scraping the web with it will return you an error most likely or return um, an unwanted or undesirable result so Web scraping is not the right once and continue running forever. It's something you have to keep checking. If you have ever used a YouTube client like Internet Download Manager or one of these other YouTube Download Managers, you would notice something. These Download Managers have to keep updating and updating. Sometimes they update every week, sometimes twice, um, per, twice um, per month and stuff like that. And the reason is simple. YouTube just keeps changing stuff about themselves. And so these guys have to keep, you know, tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. And it's a never ending game of catch up that will not stop happening. You'll continue having to change and change as long as you know the website you're scraping is changing and changing and changing. All right. So um, let's go inspect this website and then let's, let's talk about beautiful soup model. Because if you remember, I told you that when you want to pass text or when you want to analyze text or script text from a website, you use the model called beautiful soap. And then you could use selenium, you could use scrapey. So let's look at how this is. Now, when I enter this automateboringstuff.com, all right, slash this, and I press enter, I send a get request to the web server, all right? The web server pulls the HTML and sends back to my browser over the network that I'm using, obviously. So 
when I inspect this, when I click on page inspect, I could even use this view page source to just see the HTML. I'll see the whole HTML code that, you see the way this is? This is exactly what, this is the source. That's why they call it page source. This is what the server returns to my browser. And my browser just renders this. And then I see that website that I'm looking at, right? But then um, if you want to now know, know which part of this speaks to which part of the, the final website that I've seen, for example, I mean, I'm looking at this class hang, this, this, this code strong request. I don't know which part of the web. So I, I want to know, okay, this code that I'm seeing now, this paragraph, uh, this because this P tag is actually a paragraph. I think here you could see all the, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling very fast. You would see all the tags here, all right? So um, that P tag is actually, it defines a paragraph. So you want to now ask yourself, okay, so this, this, this paragraph that I'm looking at, where is it? Download files and pages from the internet. So in order to be able to um, know where it is and how it works and how it affects the browser, what you now do is, let me close this. Instead of using view page source, you could use inspect. So what inspect does is that inspect retains a copy of the rendered page on one side and the HTML code on another side. And then you would see here that CSS, the CSS codes that make reference to this. What is CSS? Cascading style sheets. It's just an extra method of styling HTML. So um, HTML could be a pain in the bots when you're using it to style it. It's not that HTML cannot be used to style. You can use HTML to style, but it could be a massive pain in the bot. So um, what, what those guys did was to come up with this other style sheet, so styling system called CSS cascading style sheets. So what it does is it takes whatever part of the HTML you target it with, and then you, you use it to, you know, um, style how it's going to look like. Where should it be in the center, which is what you can see here. Should it be on the right? Should there be a pattern? Should there be... So all of these are the things that happen in styling. So you can see all the styles here. And then you would notice that the styles um, are, are attached to a particular class. So you can see image, all right? And then you can see that this image, you, you, if you look at this here, you see that this stuff you're looking at pertains to, that's why you have this class because this class are what the CSS um, codes use to know, okay, I want to apply this image to this particular class. This is how it's going to look. So that's um, when I now start hovering around, I will now be able to see which part of the browser is affected by this. So obviously, um, if this is the top of the HTML, which is the HTML header. You notice that there is nothing. It doesn't affect anything, really, because it's the header, all right? But the moment I come to body, you will notice that it selects everything, it highlights everything to show that, okay, this place I'm hovering, these tags that are here in the body affects everything, all right? So now um, when I um, move to this place to find out, okay, where does this affect? If you, if you look at the header, you would notice that when I click on this header, it grays it, it highlights it. So, it's telling me that whatever block of codes that are inside of this place are for the header. And you can see that there are a lot of links there because I mean, if you look at the original page, you will see plenty of links. So these are all the links that you can remember, href. href are attributes, um, attributes that you can attach to an element to help make it a hyperlink, all right? So that's, that's what happens here now. Um, let me just minimize this again. Then this div is like a divider, right? To divide um, parts of a website. So maybe like block A, block B, or you know how you divide a document. So by the time I put this, it will highlight everything again here to show, okay, so all these things I'm looking for are in this div class. But then um, I'll keep going down. Okay, so this, is for the header, which is the web scraper. So if I want to um, use my web scraping to target this header, 
this is where I'll, this is the, the, the line of code that will concern me, all right? Everything that happens inside of here. Then if I want to go down a bit, let's say I want to target the images in this place, I would, would see that this class is already an image class and you would notice that it's highlighted. So, um, so this one is for the first one, no indents, the second one indented, the third one is the hanging text, which is used for code and for explanations, hanging text, hanging text. So when you want to format, um, script a website for text, oh, this is what you're going to have to go through first before you now start deciding what you want. And why is it like that? Because um, HTML is not a straightforward thing. So you can see how we went through um, all the tables first to now get to the table we're looking for when we're using pandas. It's the same thing you're going to do when you're using beautiful soap. When you want to, you have to now go through, for example, if you want to get to um, this, all right? Because this is the first image. So when I say image zero, obviously this is what will come out. But if not, I'll have to go through an iterative process, collect all the images first, then keep checking all of them, image zero, image one, image two, image three, until I find the image that I want. And like you see, the fact that this one comes first here doesn't mean that you must always see it up or something. Um, like you saw in the web page, um, you saw table one, all right, which was this. Now, this might even be table two, or this might be table one, and this might be table two, who knows? So it, it, it's not something you just do out of guess, guesswork. It's something you have to actually, you know, apply your hands on and all right, get that information. So is there a question? You know, I told you I'm always worried when the session is very quiet and nobody's asking anything. So, but um, I would just, <laughs> just assume that I'm safe and that we are all fine. Okay. So now um, let me, let me, um, Let's use this, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to um, my collab and then let's call this how to, how to script text using beautiful soap. Before we even go to how to script tests using beautiful soup, um, because we are trying to uh, we are trying to use Al's book as our compass. I know you probably have read this project, map it the py with the web browser module. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through this project, and I would explain how it works. So just give me a second. So when you want to, when you want to um, strip stuff from the web, sometimes you might decide to, let me just go back to this, my document here. Sometimes you might decide to script the web using, let me just use this methods of scraping. Okay, basically we've talked about this here. You could do that using a browser or a GUI tool. GUI is a graphical user interface, any tool that has a GUI, or you could use the command line. So this map it um, example here, was just to show you how to use the command line, 
All right, how to use a browser actually, not the command line, how to use a browser. All right, to, to scrape a to scrape a, a path, to do a web scraping. Basically, you want to get stuff from uh, the web, all right? So this is what I'm going to do now. Um, before I go into using Beautiful Soup, let me just run this code here so that you can see how it works. So for this mapit.py, all right, what this app basically does is that it goes from your command line or your clipboard and picks a particular address, all right? And then when it takes that address, it will open up your browser and go to Google Maps and check that page for the address, okay? And so obviously what that means is that your code will need to be able to read your command line and also read your clipboard. Your clipboard is that part of your, um, your computer, your computer's operating system that ha has a short-term memory where it stores information that you have copied. So when you copy something, it goes to the clipboard waiting for you to paste it or stuff. So it's that short-term memory, all right, that waits for you to um, paste stuff. Basically, that's what your clipboard does, all right? So um, when you've done that, then you, op your, you open the browser and you now check the web page. So let's solve this code here that um, this man did out. Oh, and then let me explain how it works. So now the first thing we want to do is that we want a street address, all right? So let me just use the same street address he used, okay? But before we do that, um, we, we have, two libraries or two particular libraries that are very, very important when you're web scraping and you're trying to use a browser, right, in your web scraping. So the first library is called the requests library. What does the request library do? I'm going to show you right now. So um, let me import requests and let me show you what it does. So this is it. When I say, um, my web, okay, let me just say Chris, let me call this Chris. Uh, let me just call this Al Swigert. Automate the boring stuff with Python. Equal to, now I shouldn't do this. My variable name should be readable, but I just wanna just show you how this request model works. So requests, dot get. Now you can see that what this request model is doing is that instead of me using a browser or a client to make this get requests, this module is bypassing the browser and just making that get request for me. So if I put the website here, request dot get this, all right? And I say print, um, ATBWSP, let's see what it tells us. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, do you see what it tells us? It just tells me response 200. Why response 200? Very simple. It tells me the website is live, is active, and you can go ahead and interact with it. If you gave me another response like 403, 404, or some other responses, then I'll know the website is barred or something, all right? So this, um, this request.get gives you a response object. Now you can now decide, and you know, like I told you, when, when your browser is sending back, when the server is sending back a response, it also sends a HTML file along with it, all right? So this HTML file, we can now get the text inside the HTML file. 
remember, since we have used this as the name of our requests, um, uh, the name of our requests, we can just put dot text here so that it can now give us the text attached to the HTML file, uh, right, to the response. So when I run this, you would see a crazy shitload of, sorry, I used that word, um, big load of HTML text, all right? And it's just plenty. So this, if I were using a browser, when my browser sends the GET request, I get this. But since I'm now using a Python module to send a GET request, it gives me all of this. I don't need all of this. So I will now have to use beautiful soup to now start parsing this whole stuff until I can get out what exactly it is that I want, all right? So that's how the whole thing works. Now, um, uh, excuse, go ahead. Can't I just copy and paste from the website? <laughs> you can, <laughs> surely you can, truly you can, you can and it's, it's, but where will you paste it? Will you paste it inside your code? It's going to make your code very lousy, right? It's going to look very organized, unorganized. Imagine pasting the whole of all of this inside your um, code. But they'll be without, they'll be without the- They will be the with the tags. The, no, they will not they be will. with all this markup, this HTM, this uh, markup. They will, they will. The tags, they will always be there. They will not be with the tags. Like if I copy and paste, not like if you copy okay, and like paste this now. This if you copy now, this, like yes, okay, <laughs> and then there. you paste this. Then why are you web scraping? Because you're not automating anything anymore. Because <laughs> the moment you start using your hand to copy and paste then it just means that automation by goodbye to automation. So that's, that's where the Wahala is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so do we, do we, do we all, are we all on the same page? Are we together? Yeah, we have, we have, thank okay, you. Cool. Okay, yes, cool. yes, yes. All right, thank you. So um, so now you can see that we, we have the text from this web, web page that we just copied. And then if I want to now pass, I can use Beautiful Soup to pass this, but we're going to come to Beautiful Soup shortly. So let me just um, continue with this, this example that I'll give here. Now, um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to open the web browser and then go to Google Maps and then get an address out, all right? So let's go to Google Maps, shall we? And let's just open Google Maps, uh, google.com. It's, yep, okay, so this is Maps. So this is what happens when you use Google Maps to search. Now, um, you can just decide to search for a particular place. So you could decide to search for um, 333 Fremont Street, San Francisco, which is the headquarters of Flutter Wave. And bam, you get this, all right? So you can now decide what you want to do from here. You can decide to actually script the directions because you can want to build an application to say, okay, I want when, um, because right now, the way it is, if you want to use Google Maps, you have to click on directions and you have to now listen for the directions and all of that. But if you don't want to do that, you probably can create a, an application that, um, that's you know, from the starting point, captures the text in all these directions that Google Maps is going to give you and then probably just read it out to the person using natural language, all right, process and NLP. So instead of maybe the person is disabled or maybe blind there for something or whatever, maybe blind. So all he just needs to do is just to use a voice, 333 frame on straight, and then your scraper goes into motion and bam, returns all the steps that Google would have just outlined for you here and voices is out. So Take the next turn from Arlington to so, 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 and then, you know. So 
that's that's one application of this uh, app that Al did here. Now let's just look at how it works. So the first step is to figure out the URL. And the URL, like I said, is the Google Map URL. So um, which is this maps.google.com. And what happens when you really put this in is just that when you put an address, it 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 goes into the browser, all right, and just shows you this. But one of the things that I've discovered about requests, especially when you're making it from a client like a browser, is that you see all of this plus plus ads and all of this additional stuff. They are nothing. They are nothing. You can actually run this from here, all right? And the browser will still return the right direction for you. Here we are, same thing. You now ask yourself, so why did it populate all of this? Now, all the other population of stuff that you see most times in links are just nonsense. Not like nonsense per se, but they are used to either um, do um, like, they call it urchin targeting mechanism. You would have seen some websites that you see UTM, UTM slash referral or whatever. They're used to, it's just a, some sort of internal filing system. Probably I want to know, okay, who referred this person? So this is the person's affiliate link. When you click on this system, just captures and expands that affiliate link so that when that transaction goes through, SEM knows, hey, okay, it's so and so person that refers the person. Or what channel did this request come from? Was it mobile? Was it web? Was it um, desktop? Was it some other form? You know, so that's what most URLs use those stuff to do. It's not like it's really part of the the whole thing. So the main thing that is part and that's required is this, which is this, this, and this. All right. So now um, let's let's build an application. All right, that would take the address, all right, and then move it into the browser. But we have a problem. The problem is that we do not want to use a clipboard or stuff. We want to use the command line. And that is one of the places where many programmers have issues because they don't like using the command line. And uh, yes, I was in that place before. I had to start forcing myself to learn how the command line works. So I'm going to have to open the command prompt. One of our biggest enemies now going to be our friends and <laughs> see how this whole thing works. Okay. So um, before we talk about the command line, I'm going to talk about the modules that are going to be required to run this. Now, um, I'm going to just delete this. I like to use Visual Studio here instead of Colab because I want to make contact with my Colab. I hope you know that Colab is hosted on Google's runtime. And because of that, there is no way it can interact with your system unless you domesticate the runtime. I have to, this is you connect to a local runtime. So that's the way that your command line and your collab can sync. That's one way you can sync that. But besides that, I don't know if there's another way there might be, but personally, I don't know, right? So, but that's not what I want to do right now. I don't want to sync this to my local runtime. I want it to still run on Google's browsers. So um, that's why I'm not using collab for now. I'm going to use VS Code that is synced to my runtime, all right? And we're going to be fine. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to just delete this, and delete this. And okay, let me just comment this out because it might come in handy much later instead of deleting. So there are three modules that I'm going to need. I'm going to need this, which is called web browser. I'm going to need a paper clip, and then I'm going to need sys. Now let me hide the request and BS4 because we're going to get there. Now this is what these modules do. When I call web browser, 
all right? And I use the dot .open or the dot .get method, but let me use the dot .open method. What this web browser dot .open does is that it takes the URL that I want it to go to, and then it goes there and gets what I need it to get. So let me just take this uh, maps.google.com and put it inside of this place. All right. Okay. So when I run this right now, watch what happens. It goes and opens up my default browser, which in this case is Chrome. No, I think it's Edge, but let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Okay, so Edge is my remote browser. Edge is my home browser. That's why I thought it was actually Chrome. Okay, so um, yeah. So it just opens the Google Maps on the browser, but you can see it doesn't have any page or any, any number attached to it to search. All right, it's just blank Google Maps, nothing. So the next question is, how are we going to get these addresses that we want, like this one now, how are we going to get it into the Google Map? So let's go to um, how Python even runs on the command line. I know it's a lot to digest. I'm probably not going to talk about beautiful soup here because um, it's almost four o'clock. It's like 20 minutes to four. So I, I'm, I don't want to have to do a lot of information overload. We probably are going to continue this next week. Now, let me, let me, just highlight all of this. And let's talk about how Python runs on the command line. So that's what I'm going to do right now is just going to be very clear. Let's look at this. Let's say I create an awesome program, all right? Remember the name of this, my file is PyLib. And this awesome program that I just created, all it does, it's a print hello world, awesome, right? So it's a massive program. Google is actually very interested in this program and that's what it does, all right? So it's hello world. Now, um, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to run this from the command line. There are two ways to run any Python program you have just created. You know, like for instance, look at this Python program I created one time, just a small um, application. Now, if you want to run this, this application, it's a GUI application. You will either have to go through your VS code, which when you run, run Python file, it brings out the GUI and it just, yeah, which is the small GUI, all right? It just brings this out. And what it does is it takes a dollar amount like this, $780, and calculates the exchange rate in pounds. So it's just a dollar to pounds um, converter, all right? That's what the application does. So when I so calculate, it tells me your $780 is worth this amount in pounds, all right? So this is one of the ways I can run. Okay, somebody unmuted themselves, talk to me. Um, somebody unmuted themselves. Okay, okay, okay. So um, I will just assume it was an error. All right, so. This is one way you can run this application by calling the application from inside of VS Code. And then, yeah. Well, actually, if you look at it, what VS Code is actually doing when you call this application or when you try to run it is to open your command line. And I told you this terminal you see here is actually your command line. So to open your command line and run this same application inside the command line, all right? So that's what VS Code does. So whatever GUI, whatever GUI application you're using, whether it's an IDE, like VS Code, Atom, whatever, or any other form of whatever it is you're using, has to default to the command line to run, all right? Usually that's what happens. So 
Let's say I want to run this, my awesome application here. Hello world, all right? Um, and I don't want to go through my VS code. I don't want to go to any GUI. I want to go straight from the command line and I want to run it. How do I go about it? Very simple. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have to go and find out where this thing is, the file. So open revealing file explorer. Okay, so I'm going to reveal this in my file explorer. And yep, so this is the path. So I could just copy the address and come to my command line and do a change of directory and tell Python, um, tell the command line to move to this directory. You can put this in inverted commas and like you could just do this, sorry, this and have an inverted comma there, it will still work. It can work with or without the inverted comma, all right? It, some, sometimes when you call, copy your path, you might even have an extra like this, it will still work, all right? But it doesn't have this, it will work. But let me just change my directory. So now um, I've changed my directory, the current working directory where I am to this place where I have my Visual Studio file that contains the hello world. Remember that hello world is called pylib.py, all right? So if I want to run this Python file without Visual Studio or any other GUI, um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to call that Python, that's the interpreter. So when I say Python, I'm telling the, um, the OS to launch Python for me, that Python is what I want to use to um, run this application. And this is why it is very important to have your Python in path. Um, for some of us who have not installed a Visual Studio yet, if possible, you will notice that when you're installing Visual Studio, you're installing Anaconda, um, they will ask you, do you want to add to path? This is just what happens when you add stuff to path. So when you add to path, you remember when this class was starting, I, okay, cool. All right, so when this class was starting, I, I, had to, um, I had to show how you do this stuff, add to path, all right? But um, look at this. So, so this is what happens when you add stuff to path. It becomes very easy to call that thing from the command line. So now that I've added my, path, my Python in the path, my um, OS knows that anytime I call the command line, Python, and then I'm just say Python, it knows where to locate the interpreter because a path has been created from the OS to say, okay, anytime somebody calls this Python interpreter, just go to that path. For example, let me exit this. I just, um, if you want to exit, just type exit. Let me come back to my command prompt again. Now, just look at this, I type Python. My system already knows where the Python is because I created a path to find Python, all right? That's what that path basically does. It just helps you um, know how to, how the system should find the path. So let me change that directory again. Um, change directory, cd this, and then I would, um, then I would now call Python, which is the, interpreter, then I will now call pylib.py, which is the file I want to execute. Now, when I enter and tell the command line to run it, see what happens. It runs that application and gives me all the results that are expected as the application runs. So in this case, it's hello world. If I run that tkinter app that I did, it will bring out the UI and then ask me to impute the number I want to change from USD to pounds and stuff like that. So that's basically how you run your application. But then sometimes you might need to supply some arguments in addition to, um, in addition to, in addition to the function call. So when you call Python, for example, pylib, dot py. If I just even add some arguments, so let me just add some people's name in this class. Okay, um, Aziz and Tima. Now, this will give me an error, right? When I 